start recording. We're recording here in the session, the follow-up session on representations in the brain. We started this a few weeks ago, now two or three weeks ago with uh, Russ Boldrack. Russ gave a presentation of a paper that he has published recently. And Mike Anderson and his, and his uh, Ippolito were commentators. And there were a lot of discussion, there was a lot of discussion and a lot of interest that followed that uh, on Twitter. And, and possibly other by other ways of communication that people were discussing back and forth some of the ideas that were discussed that that were that were in in the in the session itself but that continued over the next several days and weeks so we decided to continue the discussion and not having anyone necessarily present but open here to anyone who wants to explain it all to us and, and outline uh, how we should be thinking about this, but pretty open-ended discussion so that we can follow, uh, follow up with some of the questions that were uh, vigorously and heatedly debated uh, in the coming, in the days uh, following the initial session. So I don't have any specific format that we should be following here. I did recommend, I did have a recommendation, but even that I would like to gauge if you, if people find this recommendation to be useful, because a little bit from Twitter, it's sometimes it's hard to know if the silence is, is a little bit lack of enthusiasm or just that some people are preoccupied with other things and obviously not, um, not following up. So my suggestion whether that, that I was thinking that would be useful and that's something that I'd like to start our debate with is, is whether is it worth trying to briefly perhaps or more extensively de define a little bit of roughly define not precise uh, fixed definitions but roughly define what we're talking about when we talk about representations and we are neuroscientists, cognitive sciences, philosophers. One of the things that I've noticed in the debate that follow up on Twitter that I wasn't very engaged in it. I was reading it quite a bit, but I wasn't, my, wasn't myself engaged very much. But one of the things that I noticed that was very clear is that a person would write something and a, another person would reply, but saying, but look, my interpretation is different. And according to, and, and then just go in a different direction. And then you would be coming back and forth through all these this zigzag of this meandering of definitions or implicit definitions or understandings or interests even. It's like, oh, I don't care about the representational theory of mind. I mean, that was really interesting in the 80s and I heard about that, but you know, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm, I don't care about that. And so perhaps, perhaps you don't care about it. Perhaps you don't understand it. So there are all these issues that you say, oh, you would really care if you understood it. That's a different issue that we can debate, but I, I felt that a lot of the conversation was, was getting bugged, was, was getting um, thrown around and, and not being as productive, if could, anyone could say that for a discussion on Twitter, as productive if we knew a little bit better what we meant. So I thought that we, we have this discussion here today, maybe part of it, if, people find it's useful partly in, in trying to define what is it an, a representation for a neuroscience? What is a representation for uh, a philosopher, a cognitive scientist? Yeah, Kevin, go ahead. I mean, I think you, everyone can, I mean, this is a small group. I think we can unmute ourselves and just kind of, we can just. Um, yeah, thanks, Louise. And thanks for um, bringing this back together again. I just wanted to suggest, I guess, um, uh, in thinking about definitions, I find sometimes that they leave a lot unsaid and that they're, when people are using a definition, they're coming with a lot of, of baggage from a certain perspective. And that may not be apparent to the people reading just the, the, the crisp definition that those people are using. So I guess rather than just a definition, um, what would be really helpful for me would be more of an explication of what concepts a representation you know means for different people in different fields and and what implications it has 
um, you know, whether it means you're thinking of a computational theory of mind or whether it, you're thinking in an inactive sense or um, something to be operated over, whatever that means, um, all of those things get bandied about. And I think sometimes they're hidden and implicit in if we just restrict ourselves to, you know, a one sentence definition. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm, I'm the first one to be very skeptical about definitions and more generally speaking and, 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 and having worked on interactions between emotion and cognition and being forced to define what you mean by emotion. Yeah. I've been the first to push back, but at the same time, it might be worth not defining then, but outlining, okay, what is it about representations that you think is important or like along the lines that you are encouraging, right? So we need something that can help a little bit coalesce or yeah. reorient ourselves so that we can. Do you, do you think, Louise, it might be helpful to share that, that Google Doc? Because there were a few questions at the start of it that might ground things a little bit, you know, around. Yeah, what, I, I did. I work. did share. I did um, include it in um, in the chat. Um, Maybe we could share the screen. Well, oh, uh, I see. Even share the screen. Ah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah, just sure. do I have it here on the screen? And maybe we could. Uh, do you want me to just share it? And maybe I could just run through a couple things here. Uh, that, yeah. That, can, are, are you allowed to share? Oh, I don't know. Uh, okay. No. So I'm just asking uh, so that I make sure that I allow you to share. Okay. okay. So. Yeah, it looks like we can. I, I just okay, made you yeah. co-host, so you you should be well, if you weren't already. Host. It just says host disabled. Oh. Oh, wait, no, hang on a sec. Let me try again. Okay, I can, yeah. Good, now where is it? Here. Okay. All right, we, maybe we just start with this. And um, Can people see this here now? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, the co first couple of questions here were from Louise, and the first one was um, what he just said. How can we define representation, uh, you know, based on the uses of neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, philosophers, I would add um, computer scientists and AI people to that, to that list, I think, because um, in a sense, that's where, that's where this philosophical debate, uh, the rubber meets the road, you know, in, in the um, concerns around uh, design of, of AI and deep learning and stuff like that. Um, this is a different way to formulate that question, which is what do representations do for neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, and philosophers? That is, within your framework, what, uh, what work is the concept of representation doing for you? When you say that, what, what implications does it have that other people in the field understand um, and, and can use? And uh, if I can, I'll just run through a couple uh, things that had occurred to me. First of all, there's lots of different types of things that can be represented and they don't have to be represented in the same way. You could have percepts, beliefs, desires, goals, emotions, predictions, actions, movements. Um, you know, all of those could have some neural representation or neural correlate, but those, you know, the, the neural correlate of a, of a percept might be very different from the neural correlate of a belief, say. And I certainly think it's different from knowledge and memories and, and things like priors and instincts and biases which, um, you know, some of these might be represented by a transient neural signal, some by a pattern of neural activity that it could be transient or, you know, reverberating. Uh, but some of them, like knowledge, I think is, is not necessarily represented, but maybe just instantiated by a pattern of synaptic weights or a broader configuration of circuitry. And, and um, you know, central pattern generators are added there, I think is a good, exemplar of the embodiment of um, you know, a set of, of, of regularities, in this case of regular actions, that you wouldn't necessarily say represent the action, but they embody it and carry it and carry it out. So the first thing for me, I guess, just thinking about neural representations would be among the people who've thought about it a lot more than I have. What do people think about this, this sort of distinction between representations in the activity of neurons and representations in the configurations of neurons because it feels like in the in the you know, computer science deep learning ai sort of um debates those things get confused and they get confused a bit between computationalism and connectionism which may be 
computationalism may be better for representing these things, connectionism may be better for representing those things. So maybe that's a, a starting point, Louise, if you think that's um, useful, just to see. If oh yeah, it's, I, it I, I think fact. we should all, uh, I mean, it's it's not my meeting, I'm just here for us to, to facilitate. So I think that we should, as a group, decide a little bit what are the directions that we feel more more more, more well. I mean, it, valuable. We can. Well, do you want me to just run through the rest of this then? And uh, um, yeah, anyone, sure. You know, anyone can chime in on any of these things. I, I think that you know what work is the concept of representation doing? How does it help to think of things as representations? As can I can I break in here just for a second? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because I, I, the, this is this is useful, and I want to put Russ on the spot here because he has an interesting bit in the article that he presented uh, in our last meeting, and that I guess most people have probably read by now, where he he contrasted the representational theories versus dynamic systems theories, saying that representational ones are useful for perceptual kinds of explanations, and the dynamic systems ones are useful for motor control sorts of things, and that, that seems apropos here. Mm -hmm. with, to the question of, of what, what representations do for neuroscience, right? So I, I just wondered if he could, he didn't say much about that in the paper, but it was a very interesting sort of contrast. I wonder if he had more to say about that contrast and, and, and why representations are, are needed for the one kind of, of explanation and not for the other. I guess, uh, yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, I, I wouldn't frame at least I didn't mean to state it in the paper in the way that you just stated it, which is kind of, kind of a fundamental claim that one is more, you know, that, that there's a, there's something more dynamic about motor systems and something more representational about or mechanistic about, you know, uh, perceptual systems. The, the, the claim is really that that's how it's worked out in, in the science that, you know, um, representational types of approaches like deep convolutional neural networks um, have been, you know, particularly effective in understanding the visual system, those types of approaches have not been as effective in understanding the motor system and dynamical systems approaches have been more effective. And it may well be that, you know, that they, that somebody could come up with a way of, you know, bringing the dynamical systems things to bear on the visual system. That just isn't how it's happened. Um, so I, that, I wasn't meaning to make an in principle claim about that or really just a claim about how the, the research has worked out. Oh, but it's actually interesting, Russ, you say that because, for instance, like I'm, I'm going to interrupt Johan because he's probably going to say the same thing and I'm going to say, because from the place and training that we come from, they're all a visual system and all the visual stuff and perceptual stuff is all dynamic because, you know, we're, we're you know, each one of us did a dissertation on a slightly different aspect of how do contours in, 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 in multiple elements joined together in some dynamic fashion that has some temporal evolution and whatnot. And all, the, all of those were dynamical systems type of models, right? And so in a sense and that- How are those models doing at object recognition these days? Well, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, near I mean, as well, as as sorry, I don't, well, as yeah, they, they, they have network, been right? outcompeted. I'm not saying, I mean, it's, but it's easy to say that, right? Cause you could also say that you know, fossil fuel cars 10 years earlier did a lot better than electric cars because they had had, you know, 100 years of um, advances that electric cars didn't have. So I'm not saying that the models that we were working on are the way to go or the only way to go or are inherently superior. That's not what I was saying. I was saying is that there are ways of looking at the visual system that are highly compatible with dynamics and yeah. with uh, with a type of framework that you you were saying, according to uh, Michael's description, that are, are are more could be more tuned to to, to motor control. So yeah, all I'm saying is that many people view many of the aspects of the brain through some kind of general dynamics, and I wouldn't necessarily claim that one aspect, um, even historically. I know that, yes, we were in the minority group. We, we you know, we were the, the Apple who lost to Microsoft before Apple became what it is now, you know, so we, but we, our time will come. Apple, Apple, you know, Apple overcame 
Apple overcame Microsoft eventually. So these kinds of frameworks uh, will 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 come come back. And it's not going to all be be big deep neural networks, convolutional networks that are just brute force approximator function approximator. So I, but, I, I don't want to get in the way of the other comments. I just want to sort of respond to that quickly to say that you know I I agree with you that ultimately the explanations that we need that we're going to need to understand how the visual system really works are are going to be are going to have to be more dynamic than a feed forward convolutional neural network right the my point was just that so far right now in the science there there have been some systems where dynamical models have been much more successful some where they have not been where they're not the state of the art right now that's that's the only claim i want to make i don't want to i don't want to say that ultimately they, that you know one of them necessarily right. and I, yeah i didn't mean to <laughs> sidetrack us into a a, a war of a, um uh, yeah yeah but let's get back to let's getting back to the representational issue then maybe um uh michael can 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 bring us back to in what way that he thinks the point might orient us in certain directions um well, there are two people with hands up. Uh, oh, okay. I can I can offer a couple of sentences. I, I I just I mean you know if those of you who saw my my presentation a few weeks ago uh, know that you know I, I don't much care what we call the kinds of um, neural activity patterns that Russ has identified. If we want to call them representations, it's fine. I'm I'm more interested in in the big picture of what what we think we're doing in neuroscience. Are are we mm -hmm. Are we trying to um, describe a computational system of a certain sort and in which things like representation may play a role? And if and you know the convolutional neural networks are, are a nice model for that if that's what we're we're up to. But they're very different from say representational theory of mind. And and so one of the things I'm interested in, and I'll bet Bryce has something to say about this, he's got had his hand up for a while. Um, is, is whether in the neurosciences, folks think we are still in the business of trying to define a computational system, uh, or are we doing something different from that? And, and the, the answer to that question is gonna tell us a lot about what that word representation does, the, the Kevin's question, right? Um, because if we do still believe in representational theory mind or computational theory mind, well, then that word is absolutely crucial. If all we care about are information carrying transient states, which everybody believes in, um, but we're really trying to define a dynamic system, um, then that that word is just much less contested. It it, it doesn't, it, you know, it, it's just not worth arguing over anymore because everyone believes we have information carrying transient states in the brain. Um, uh, anyway, I'll stop there because, you know, like I said, both Bryce and, and Johan have had their hands up for a bit. Yeah, Bryce uh, or Johan, uh, any either of you want to go go ahead? I mean, again, feel free to. We can do this much more dynamically, like you know, not like uh, asking for you know, hand up or I. It can be a little bit more anarchic today, I would suggest. You're right. I was about to say what you just said, but I could add one thing that these. Uh, uh, discrete uh, um, neural networks are dynamical systems. They just have really boring dynamics. So, and and to some extent, comparing the uh, the performance on face recognition of a deep net to a to a neural model is slightly unfair. It's sort of like comparing a car to a horse, right? Well, the car can go faster, but that's not really all we want from the model, right? So, so there's all this we want to account for, say, lesion data, illusions neon color spreading like the whole there's lots of different things that you might want to explain so yes the performance might be not as good but that doesn't necessarily mean that a model uh, is not useful for the wider um, topic of explanation and i think since people are talking about computation now it might be useful instead of de defining representation because I, I agree that if it just means information carrying state then no one cares it would be useful to define computation because i'm actually quite confused by what people mean by it I'm happy to I, say. I agree. I agree with that. Confused, you know, I'm sorry to, yeah. to jump like in. Planets that's don't confuse, compute their orbits. Yeah, and that's, that's fine. No one disagrees. Let's with let's that. get to that in a second, though. Let's like I mean, let's see if there's some some points that Bryce wants to bring up before we get back to computation. But if we get sidetracked, please remind us to 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 focus on computation because I I think that that's really key because when Michael says you know what are, are we interested in a computational 
theory of mind. And then to me, it feels like he's one type of computational theory of mind, but maybe not to him. So I think we need to clarify that too. So uh, Bryce, do you wanna, um, do you wanna? Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so so I, I think this is actually very close to following on the point that Mike made about um, how just about everybody is committed these days to um, information, transient information bearing states of some sort. There are gonna be cases where it's a little bit hard to see whether transient information bearing states are sufficient to solve some of the kinds of problems that we want, especially human brains to be able to solve. And specifically, I'm thinking about cases, um, and this is drawing on that contrast from Russ, where you've got things like capacities to track um, novel kinds of cars as cars, or particular things as coffee cups, even though they're strangely shaped coffee cups, where you're getting variation in, I mean, really wide ranging variations in object position, distance, um, the way that things are oriented, lighting, background uh, patterns, ways in which the current visual state is uh, deforming the presentation of the information, ways that it uh, correlates with or deviates from whatever the exemplar is. All of those things need to be in some sense captured in a story that allows for the extraction of invariant structure across those differences. And it's a little bit hard to see how you get something that solves that invariance problem that isn't drawing on something that looks very much like a representational story, even if it's a, a relatively thin one of the sort that Russ is gesturing towards. But, um, Bryce, I think, um, you know, what it sounds like is that, yeah, we have these transient neural signals that are information bearing, and then they're interpreted through this pattern of synaptic weights and configuration of circuitry that embeds or embodies knowledge and, and structure about the world. So it seems to me you need both of these types of things and that, that, that if this is where um, we have information, perceptual information and so on about the current things, but we also need the knowledge in the system that's there. And, and um, I don't, it, it almost feels sometimes in the deep learning field from the outside that there's this war between those two ideas um, when it seems to me kind of obvious that you need both of them. So I, I don't quite understand that that tension, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm misreading it. Um, but I did just want to say in, in uh, follow up to Johan's question about computations, um, that a question occurs that, that has occurred to me because I hear it a, a lot is the idea that a representation is something that's operated on or operated over. Um, and I don't know what that means to computationalists. Uh, so maybe someone here could, could enlighten us, or enlighten me anyway. Let me, uh... I actually want to address that, Kevin, but let me just also amplify what Bryce said. If anybody here hasn't read Kathleen Aiken's uh, seminal paper of sensory systems and the aboutness of mental states, I urge you to go run right now and get it. It's an amazing piece. But one, and, and, it, and it takes a largely anti-representational view of sensory systems. And yet at the end of that paper, she throws down a challenge. She says, yeah, sure, the frog can experience the fly as a dark moving dot that it will snap at, but how do you then experience that it as a fly? And moreover, how do you experience it as Fred the fly, an individual particular? And these are very deep challenges for the anti-representationalist view and, and challenges that we haven't really solved. I, I don't think representationalism solves them either. It just kind of hand waves about, you know, how, how that's going to all work. And so, um, so I think, I think this, is, this is a genuine and deep uh, issue that hasn't been, I think, appreciated by either side of, of this debate uh, uh, as fully as it needs to be. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll do that in a sec, uh, Roberto. Um, uh, I, I'll, 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 I'll post that in the chat in a, in a, in a second. As far, I, I agree, by the way, um, with this, this question about what computation means. And, because you know we have Turing machines, 
And I think somehow in the background, everyone's assuming that that's what we're talking about. And when we talk about operations over symbols, we're talking about things that are like Turing, Turing machine-like or you know, Turing complete operations. But there are lots of other kinds of computation out there. And, I, and I'm, I'm starting to wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, um, you know, maybe the real neuroscientists on this call uh, have some insight on this, but I, I'm wondering if, if some of these other notions of what computation is have, have kind of bled their way into neuroscience, especially as a lot of computer scientists and physicists have started to make an impact within, within the field of neuroscience. And they may be bringing to bear sort of, uh, they may bring to bear certain um, conceptual frameworks that, that are at, haven't been spelled out in, in quite the detail that say Turing has, or that, that Shannon information has been spelled out, things like this. But I, I think we started with that. I, I think from, from McCulloch and Pitts and the early AI stuff that supposedly drew inspiration from the nervous system, I think neuroscientists took that computational model of lo logical operations and, and just sort of took that as the ground the ground state, uh, you know, on which we stood, and um, and went with that. So I think we've inherited that very idea that what the brain does is logical computational operations. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't not, fully I mean, understand what it means. What I don't fully understand what a re what role the representation has in that framework. But let me let me just mention very briefly. I don't I don't think, uh, Kevin, that's entirely true. I mean, in, in a sense, I, mean, I completely agree with what you're saying. In a broader sense, but if you get down to how neuroscientists in the lab think, and if you say, and if they say that they have a computational sense of what the mind is doing. My take, I'd be interested in what others think. My take, you know, if I talk to my colleagues that do human work, other colleagues that do electrophysiology in rats and, and, and whatnot, it's it's it is it is not of that. I mean, if you if you even phrase it the way Michael phrased it, is it Turing machine like they will look at you like uh, what do you mean? I mean, I mean they're Many of them are hardcore biologists that don't think in those terms at all. They think in, in my view, I mean, I could be, could be wrong, but they think in terms of, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a mechanistic fashion that has to do with interactions of certain components that trigger, that release dopamine here. And this signal is phasic, that, sig is, that signal is sustained and, 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 and this leads to something else and in some such circuit or even within a certain region accomplishes something like a computes a, a reward prediction error or determines that this is a fearful face or this is a CS plus stimulus or what have you. So I think that the notion, the computational notion of a neuroscientist, if we were to assess survey that, it has nothing to do or very little to do with something like Turing-like computation. It, Maybe it applies more to people who would self-identify as cognitive scientists, I guess, as opposed to the wide swathe of people you just described. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the neuroscientists themselves that you know that study that say that they that they their degree is a neuroscience degree, or or their inclination happens it happens to be neuroscience, and 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 might have read even relatively little little amount of of anything that is human related because it's it's basically cellular and molecular neuroscience and then studying circuits and you know the hypothalamus does this when the person is hungry or or and it triggers this kind of response and and, and so i don't i don't think they they're guided by um, an overarching computational way of thinking i i, I don't even think that resonates with the way they think i mean that's my take well, I like I said, uh, you know, in many fields, probably not, but I think within cognitive science, there's a whole Oh, absolutely. In cognitive science, is a very, yeah. absolutely. I think comp you, you find exactly this way of thinking that, I mean, to, to put Michael on the spot, I mean, when Michael speaks, to me, it sounds like the way cognitive scientists speak. And I mean, I, know I don't know exactly the details of your training, but I, it seems that it, it's a very 
cognitive science like, right? And so, so it's a vocabulary and a way of thinking that is 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 sort of anchored around that that way of thinking. And that's what I'm saying is that in a neuroscientist. That's why I was trying to distinguish here neuroscientist, cognitive scientist, because I think they're drastically different in my view. Well, the then uh, the question would be, I guess, for cognitive scientists, then if they use this phrasing of, of something to be operated on, what, what do they take that to mean? Maybe it's Michael. It's a cartoon, might... basically, right? It's, a, it's like a cartoon of how mental activity might work. But when people actually go and build models, are they really, I mean, I guess some of the types of models that people build, like a John Anderson type of, like, you know, an ACT model or something mm -hmm. like that, they really are acting over propositional representations, but there's a lot of models like all the Bayesian models that people are, you know, that I think have, have really sort of taken over um, or connectionist models aren't doing that. So I think, you know, there's a, there's a, um, there's a flavor of, you know, kind of like 1970s sort of thinking around, you know, like this sort of cartoon of computational theory of mind, you know, which looks like an act star model or whatever. Um, but I don't think like the state of the art in cognitive science really looks like that, does it? I'm guessing a lot of you have probably read uh, Margaret Gordon's book, <clears throat> Mind is Machine. And she, she talks about, the, it's a good framing. So basically at the dawn of, of cognitive science, this new field, there were two kinds of strands, one more or less inspired by cybernetics. So you could say that a lot of us working with couple of differential equations are on the cybernetic side. And then there was this sort of branch inspired by computer science and linguistics. And since then there's been this tug of war trying to subsume everything under motor control or everything under language. And both are extreme positions, but th there's some weird temptation to do one or the other. So when people want to say everything looks like language, that's this so-called cognitive ism, which as Russ says, I don't, I've never met anyone in neuroscience who thinks like that. Uh, so, like, if you tell them what that what that means, that it, like vision is somehow similar to the sequential processing of language, it sounds like nonsense, right? So, I'm very curious to say who believes that nowadays. Yeah, this is an interesting well, framework, right? Because it really uh, speaks to this sort of like um, this um, uh, bifurcation, right, of uh, of these ways of thinking, and and uh, and and I, I'm I mean, Kevin, the way Kevin was describing it to me the greatest puzzle is that when i talk to neuroscientists of very different kinds they're very within their little uh, I mean, silos is a little too strong but they're within their frameworks and they're very little aware of the other ones or interested and, and it's almost like you know i study human humans and I'm not interested in, 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 in Drosophila work or and it's, it's, a, it's a really huge um, lack of communication that I find and, and even even in a, in a deeper sense that they're, they don't seem too interested because the, the issues seem so far removed from what they are interested in that they like Johan was saying okay I'm interested in cybernetics and some cybernetics to call whatever dynamic way I'm doing things with dynamical systems or differential equations or what have you, and versus a more language propositional, uh, completely different kind of framework. So it's different, the world's apart in a way. So, so I thought um, actually in response to something Michael said about the frog, you know, not needing to represent the fly as a fly, um, it, it might be useful to, to, um, to scroll down here a little bit to think about this question here, um, because I think there's, there's many sort of levels that you can have that we could all call representations to some degree. So I think what's the relationship between them? We could have pragmatic sy signals that are just coupled to action. So when the fly has a, when the frog has a dark moving spot detector, it couples to uh, an action, which is to stick its, stick its tongue out. It doesn't, have to independently apprehend the presence of the thing. It just does, it just does it almost like a reflex. And I think, you know, in an evolutionary sense, that's how meaning began. And if we're thinking about what does representation do, not for us in our theories, but what does it do for the organism, then um, maybe this is a useful way to think about it, that we could start with those pragmatic signals where the meaning of the thing for the organism is in a loop 
with the action that the organism does or the outcome that it has, whether it's good or bad, whether natural selection says that's a good thing to do or not. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're sort of a proto cognition, a basal cognition that you see even in, in bacteria. Um, but then you can get to internal semantic decoupled representations of the type that you have, for example, in our visual system, where you've got this serial processing that happens that's not directly coupled to action. It really is, I think, an internal perceptual representation in the sense of being a report that there's a line out there in the world or a report that there's a shape out there in the world or the report that there's a face out there in the world. Um, and then obviously the system has a bit more flexibility to take lots of representations like that and combine them and act on that information in a more context dependent way. So decoupling gets you, gets you greater flexibility and then you can get to symbolic representations of language and abstract arbitrary correspondences. So to me, when, uh, you know, sometimes you see people arguing that, you know, no, you can, you can do it all with this. Well, you can do some things with those pragmatic um, signals, but you can't do a lot of other things with them. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. They can all be in, in play to me. And I wonder what people make, uh, make, make of that idea. I just want to make sure that we we don't simplify the problem in a way that people tend to simplify the problem. In the case of the frog, you don't have anything that's directly coupled in exactly that way, because you've got all sorts of ongoing regulation in terms of what else is going on at the time. Is it needing to be sensitive to threats of predation? What is the ambient light like? Um, all of those kinds of factors are constantly being traded off and balanced. And that means that you've got multiple systems operating in parallel, all doing their own thing, which need to in some way be brought together in order to drive the relevant class of behavior. And that's going to get even worse when you start moving to the case of human visual perception, where it's not as though you've got something that is just a serial kind of process. You've got all sorts of loops all over the place, which are knitting together things that are partially processed sources of information with more fully processed sources of information, information for action, information for categorization, information for discrimination. And all of that's happening in ongoing ways in parallel in order to stabilize the relevant pattern of behavior. And once we start thinking in those terms, it gets really hard to sort of tell the nice simplified story that's gonna allow us to draw those discriminations. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that, Bryce, absolutely. And, and yeah, even the, obviously the frog example is not, a, is not an actual reflex. It's a context dependent action, but it is, but it is never, nevertheless a closer coupling than what we have in response to a visual scene, for example. So, um, and, and I do think you can, you can scaffold the idea of meaningful, more abstract representations on the back of quite pragmatically coupled action-related um, representations, if that makes sense. Um, so anyway, I mean, maybe the, the question of what the, what, the, what the representations do for the organism is the way to come at this as opposed to what they do for us in our, in our theories. Um, a, couple other, uh, a couple other questions here. So, one, this for me is, is a big one, um, whether a neural representation necessarily has to be a mental representation or what even is a mental representation? Is it a thought? Is it an idea? Is it a, is it a percept? Is it necessarily conscious or available to consciousness? I don't know how to, I, I kind of have a grasp of what neuroscientists mean by representation. Usually it's just a correlation of something you see in the brain, but the mental representation, I, I don't know what people mean by that or how the, I really don't know how the two are related to each other. It might be useful that there's a very simple kind of distinction which I don't think people agree on, which is the difference between seeing and seeing as. And uh, because introspection is such a strong part of how people think about perception, uh, some people will decide that like seeing a cup as a cup as and count that under perception. But if you talk to a modeler about that, that clearly involves what we call internal representations because they involve a top-down kind of template for what constitutes a cup, for instance. Uh, so 
And then there's this, this another thing which philosophers have talked about, about, about a lot, which is the myth of the given. Like, is there such a thing as perception without seeing as? Like, if you ask, if you ask Steve Grossberg and all of us who went in, are in, under that kind of framework, we'll say no, right from the get-go. Even things that we call low-level features involve top-down um, uh, expectations. You can call them priors, you can call them expectations. But so even what we consider low-level pure perception involves a certain amount of information that you know learned evolutionarily and through through training or, or just to experience so getting at the seeing as question might be the most practical version of your question kevin well i think that yeah that comes back johan to this framing here of of um you know the percepts and these, these sorts of things that may be represented by transient neural patterns only being meaningful in the context of knowledge and memories and priors and top-down context information and so on, which is probably embodied in the whole configuration of the brain and not necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say you bring to bear a representation of, a, of the, the idea of a cup to the process of seeing it. You bring to bear the knowledge about what cups are. Does, does that have to be a representation of the knowledge? I don't, I don't know if people use that phrasing that way. There's a, um, it's too bad Inez isn't here because, you know, she made some comments that, um, that I think are sort of relevant to what we're talking about here that led, so, you know, she was asking, I think, something like, you know, who is the representation for? And the, the only way that I can see answering that kind of question is, you know, involves some kind of sort of Cartesian theater. And if, if we have to do that, then I think we're just done, right? I don't, I don't know where we go from there. Um, so I'm interested to hear, you know, thoughts about, um, it, I, you know, this distinction between neural and mental representations is interesting and isn't something that, that I've kind of thought about enough. Uh, but, in, you know, in some sense, I guess if you ask me what's a mental representation, so a neural representation, I mean, I think I've said what it is, right? It's a state of a neural system. A mental representation for me would be, you know, some sort of um, state that reflects, you um, state of a system that reflects uh, you know the mental contents in such a way that whenever you're in that state you have that particular you know that particular content that would be relevant to to action or you know whatever else it's going to do for you um but i'd be interested to hear hear thoughts about this because it seemed like a lot of the twitter discussion ultimately devolved into at, to this question about who is the representation for and it's not even clear to me that that's a useful question to ask but I, i'd be interested to hear what what you know others think well can i just mention one thing and i i i think russ my my interpretation is that when a person asks that and 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 i i, I did read a little bit of that discussion i guess it's 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 the usual cartesian story right so that people having textbooks and criticize so, okay if i'm going to build a representation i'm going to do something that puts everything together in, in in let's say standard model put everything together everything is hierarchical all the way into prefrontal cortex goes into the prefrontal cortex it's unified there into a unified something or other and then and the question is okay but for for who is going to be using that? Is that a little little homunculus in there that's going to be watching it, right? So I think maybe the argument is forcing, is saying if, if there is a representation, why is this representation being built? Obviously not for someone just to be inspecting it inside of us. And that gets to, I think, I think Kevin's original uh, question, which is, okay, suppose there is a representation that is built in some sort that it could even be something that a person could be watching, a small person in our head could be watching. But assuming that there is no person inside our heads watching it, why did it get built that way? And what is it? what work is it doing then? Because obviously it's not doing, not, we're, not, we don't, we're not projecting it inside for someone to watch it in movie theater inside our heads. So why, what, what is it doing then? Right, and that's, the, that's exactly the point that I, you know, hoped that I had addressed in my paper, right? Which is it's there because if it if it wasn't there, we would not be able to behave intelligently in the world because of the curse of dimensionality. Right, but I think yeah. the argument will be convincing to others, insofar as that last connection that you made is convincing to them. Right, so 
Without that, you suffer the curse of, uh, of dimensionality and this implodes or this doesn't work. So I think it really depends on making that, that last step seems to me the critical thing, right? Because I, I, I can remember, for instance, um, a generation ago, um, writing a paper with um, Evan Thompson and Alva Noe on filling in in the brain. And then it was in his book, and consciousness, ex consciousness explained and whatnot, saying that the whole filling in thing was a Cartesian mistake and was, was a silly idea. And what the paper was arguing is the base, based in part from work from my PhD was that there was evidence that the visual system seemed to be doing some of these mechanisms from a, from a perceptual standpoint and from a neuronal standpoint, we, there was evidence that there were some of these completion, completion and filling in processes. So the question, after we wrote the paper and there was a target that was a target paper and with the commentary, one of the things that was most obvious to me is like, okay, if the brain is really doing that, what, what is it doing it for? Because it looks like it's not painting a surface inside to create some isom isomorphic representation to the external world. Is it that it provides some way of some representation or some way of uh, encoding that information so that other stages that could use information can actually use it more effectively so that it can treat something as a, as a, as a boundary, as a surface, as a, so what is it the computational, so to speak, again, again, using these words all the time, we can't get free, freed ourselves from them, but in what ways are, are these kinds of signals beneficial? So I, I completely agree with you that, uh, that I think that the, the, if we are gonna propose that they, something that feels to some people like a representation that is being painted into the brain for no, no reason, then we have to show that the reason is that without it, we can't solve certain problems, or at least evolutionarily, that's how it was solved. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I very much agree, Louise, and I think, Ross, the, you're right. That's the, the question is, who is it for? It's for the organism to do something with. Uh, and, and I think coming back, you know, that, but that raises um, the, the, the grounding problem. Like, how does, it, how does the organism know what the thing means? Um, and I think you can, if you scaffold it on the back of these evolutionarily simple, early pragmatic signals that were immediately coupled to action and you build everything on top of that, then you're grounding everything in the action and the experience of the, of the organism. They just get more sophisticated um, over time. To but my mind. but hold, hold on for a sec. I mean, let, let's just be careful the fact that organisms have experience doesn't mean they have representations. Right? No, that's, you know, that's you know, absolutely right. right. And what I'm you know, so, so we, I mean, but we've like in the last five minutes, we've already gotten into this habit of talking about this as well. There's, you know, filling in as a representational phenomenon. It's a perceptual phenomenon. It's an important perceptual phenomenon. Yeah, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. I said that some I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, interpret it. Yeah. I'm just pointing out that, that we, we have this tendency to, to slide into that vocabulary. And it's, it's just not, it's not necessary. Oh, well, Michael, actually, my point would be uh, that simple organisms uh, have some experience. They have uh, signals that they get in from the environment. They couple them to action uh, without having what we would call yep. representations. Yes. But then on top of that, when you build representations on top of that, they're grounded by, that, by everything else. That, that was there. That's, that's no, absolutely. And, and this gets to, to Johan's earlier. This gets to Johan's earlier point, which I think is really important. That and and it's useful to keep in mind that that representations per se, that is the representations involved in representational theory of mind, came into the picture because of language, and yeah. because of the notion that you couldn't possibly have productivity. Like I can I can predicate you know the X is F, but I, if I can do that, I can also do the X is a G. And the X is Y, and that right, and and so that productivity in predication is, is thought to necessitate individual, separable, movable, like 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 you know like like type, right? Movable representations, right? I can represent something as being green, ah, but I can represent not just the cup as being green, but the frog as being green, and also the tree leaves as being green, and and so that must mean I have this 
uh, individualized, separable thing that I can just move around in this way. Mm. That's a very powerful idea. Um, but it, you know, I think it turns out that in most of say understanding perception, you don't need that idea, right? Yeah. You can explain perception without those sorts of, of mechanisms, those sorts of entities. But, and then, yeah. then the real question for those of us who are really trying to push the, the not, you know, the, the ecological or the inactive or the non-representational view is, and, and I know Bryce has very strong feelings about this, well then how the heck do we get things like language? I mean, how does that supposed to work? Um, and, uh, and I don't have the answer to that question. I've said some hand-waving things about this, um, which Bryce, you know, rightly despised. Um, but, uh, but that, but I, could, I just mean, we need to keep this in mind, right? That's really where representations came to the fore. And the, in my view, the mistake in cognitive science was to read the language thing all the way back down into the basis of cognition. Yeah, I agree, and, and, and it's, it's a weird mistake to make because you're starting at evolutionarily the end point and uh, instead of following the actual way that these things evolved in the sense that symbolic representations clearly didn't exist at one stage and now they do. Uh, but, so it seems like that would be the, the final, sorry, Bryce. Go ahead, the, go ahead, Bryce. The thing to remember there is that the computational story, as you get it in McCulloch and Pitts, is doing exactly that because what it's taking is logical operations, showing that you can work them out in terms of discrete states, showing that you can map those discrete states onto particular kinds of cycles of activity in particular kinds of networks, and suggesting that that gives us a way to make sense of all of the relevant classes of behavior. And if that's what's been taken through into contemporary versions of what representational theories are, then we've probably smuggled back in way too much of our understanding of what the relevant kinds of symbol manipulation are supposed to be. And I, I take it that that's the real worry that um, the anti-representationalist folks want to push on. Yeah, I, thought, um, I might just do, just say one last sentence here and then I'm gonna, I'm just gonna stop sharing this because uh, I want, you know, probably everyone wants to be able to see each other. So maybe just one last question that I had um, thought of here was, and I maybe mentioned this the last time, the, the question in thinking of representations, we think, tend to think of them as nouns, right? It's, it's a state, it's a coding metaphor, it's coding for something. Is that a conceptual trap? Maybe we should think of representation as a verb, as an activity or process. It's something the system is doing, it's something the organism is doing. So you don't look for a, a representation of X in the brain. Uh, you instead say that your brain is representing that X is the case. Um, now maybe that's, Maybe that's obvious, uh, but it does feel like thinking of these things as nouns, uh, as objects instead of processes is a trap that can be um, hard to climb back out of maybe sometime. Anyway, I'm gonna stop sharing this now. I think this is, it's a good, it's good to try to refocus yourself towards verbs, but, and I, I'm glad the process, you know, metaphysics is becoming popular, but I suspect that you're gonna have to get back to nouns at some point. So there's a nice example before we dive into language, which is, when you say move into a new apartment or you're staying in somebody else's house in the guest bedroom, uh, over time you form something, some X that allows you to eventually navigate in the dark, okay? Now, you can call that a process if you like, but something has been learned and we have all this information that synaptic plasticity is involved and that the structural changes, you know, structural changes are, you know, if you want to call them processes, they're just way slower. <laughs> uh, but, but uh, so what do you want to call those things? If you don't want to call them, if I don't, like, it's easy for me to say, I have a representation of the room now that I've been in there for a while, so that when you turn off the light, I won't bang into things as often as I did earlier. So what do you, what would you like to call that? The thing that was learned? Well, is, is that right though? Do you have a representation of the room or do you have some now embodied knowledge of the room? Does it have to be a representation per se? I mean, cause let, let's imagine, uh, you're, you know, we're comparing someone who's aphantasic uh, with someone else, right? Who doesn't have any, you know, mental imagery. It may not be for a room like this, but for something similar like that, where they can't draw it up in their mind's eye if they don't have one. Um, do, do they have a representation of that thing? They may know a lot of things about it, right? Um, but, but maybe uh, thinking of it as a, a representational object, as opposed to a distributed web of concepts uh, and, and relations and knowledge about things 
I don't know if representation is doing extra work there or just confusing things. But that's the word that all the neural modelers have been using who were not talking about linguistic representation. So like maybe we weren't as popular in the 70s and 80s compared to the compute, the, the sort of cognitive ism. Um, but uh, what else would you, I mean, there's all this connotation of uh, it contains information, it contains some sort of resemblance, not quite isomorphism, but something uh, that allows you to pull out these relations. They may not be symbolic, they may not be logical, but they have that. So, so the issue is like, you can call it knowledge, but how does changing the term matter? I don't know that. I mean, that's, I, I think that's the question, right? And you, what, what does the term get you? Why does calling it a representation, uh, where, do, where does that get you? Or does it, maybe it just confuses things in that context. For me, there's a natural sense of a representation when I think of, you know, perceptually what the visual system is doing, right? Yeah. And I think of the receptive fields of retinal ganglion cells or simple cells in B1 or B2 or IT or whatever, that when they're active, they're giving a report that there's a line in the world or there's a face in the world or whatever. To me, that's a very natural, intuitive sense of a representation. Whereas knowing that it's your mother's face, does that mean you have in your brain a representation of your mother's face that you're comparing the two things to? Is that the operation that's being done there? I don't know. I don't know if that's right or having if using representation helps in that context. Clearly, we have a schema, a set of association characteristics that that make up, uh, you know, that my mother's face. But I don't know if a representation is the right word. But this is exactly why we need to be exactly why we need to be uh, cognizant of the framework within which we are working, right? What framework does neuroscientists, do neuroscientists think they're working within? They use the term representation, they use the term computation. This is borrowed from cognitive science. Uh, and, but I think, I, frankly, and I think this is one of the things that Russ's paper showed us, that this is just momentum on the part of neuroscience. It's just that's the way people started talking and they still talk that way. But historically, but it wasn't but it's, borrowed come, from but it's come to mean some things that are very, very different from the initial framework. And but it's funny, the, the, you know, neuroscience should just own this, right? We're doing a mechanistic thing. Here are the bits of the mechanism that we're describing. So we're like molecular biologists here. Uh, and that's cool. And it's awesome, you know, great science. But then let's just acknowledge that the framework, the vocabulary of the framework that got adopted, say, in the 70s and 80s, is no longer applicable to what's actually going on in the science. But the framework didn't come from cognitive science. Like Hewlings Jackson was using the concept of representation long before there was anything called cognitive science. So if you look through the history of it, it's been around. Sorry, sorry cognitive, cognitive science is much older than, than, much older than that. Locke was a cognitive scientist. And it comes, this stuff comes straight out of Locke, right? And it comes straight out of Locke through Fodor. So that's, that's what I mean, you know, uh, uh, was it, uh, I was accused of being a cognitive scientist and I suppose I am, right? I've got a postdoc in artificial intelligence and a PhD in philosophy and taught psychology for many, many years. So yes, guilty. But uh, when I say that, I don't mean the 1950s stuff. I, I mean, I mean the, the sort of philosophy of mind, the mechanistic philosophy of mind stuff going back to, to Locke. And that's very clearly where this comes from, including the Hewlings Jackson stuff. Well, Michael, can I say one thing? Was when you say, okay, so when you say that neuroscientists should own it and and it's mechanistic and all, I mean, maybe one thing that I that I find interesting is that there are all these levels that we can be thinking of, right? Let's say we're kind of thinking in a systems neuroscientist, uh, someone who does neuroimaging, for instance, just to make something to have it concrete. So what many times happens is that you might have a type of process, let me call it, I mean, I'm not, don't mean exactly like process in the sense of process theory, but you might have some kind of process or some kind of, um, I'll call it process. You have some kind of process that does something uh, in, in presumably in prefrontal cortex that is related to cognitive control. And, and then you, based on that, you propose some kind of theory or some model of general cognitive control that you do inhibition this way and you do task switching this other way and you do attentional selection and these things partly overlap or don't and what have, what have you. So oftentimes 
it feels to many people, including some of the people who are working on it, that we build so much intelligence or capabilities into the processes that we're postulating, the processes that we're studying, that it in itself becomes a problem to explain how they have that, right? So to, to, to undo, to break down, get rid of that homunculus, that other kind of homunculus that, or a related one, I guess, that has that inherent intelligence that can do all, all those sorts of things. So when you say that neuroscience should own it, uh, I think that there, there's a large class of postulates of things, let's call them things, of things that people talk about, objects that people talk about, that sort of rely on, make assumptions that are uh, strong enough, I would say, that it, it feels that they are assuming that you know, I have a panel in my mind and this, this thing is, is, is filling this, this, this is what I was attending to. And then there's this other list of other things that I might attend to. And then there's a priority list and I keep this thing in a buffer and the buffer gets updated and whatnot. So it, that's, that's a, at a level that is incredibly representational for others who read who are looking out is like, why are we postulating these things? So one of the, one of, one of the things that I have often asked people why, they, they, they think it's a very natural way of thinking about it. And, and so I'm not exactly sure what my original point was, but, but what I'm trying to say is that the constructs, the, the constructs are really heavily informed by these complex objects that are these building blocks of even this neuroscience of this at this intermediate level, right? But so that's exactly get... why Russ has an entire project on the ontology of psychology, right? And, and how- Right, that... right, to find, find, find the right operations, whether, what are they operating on and, and, and things of that sort, right? But I guess my question is, I guess you're, the way you were referring to neuroscience is that neuroscience could be mechanistic enough that could get rid of some of these problems that we have to get to things like language. But nonetheless, if we can get, suppose we can for many things that are, are solvable that way, what I'm trying to say is that there's this enormity of, there is an enorm enormous amount of other things that are still very much like that traditional representational type of thing. That's, I guess, my point. Yeah, yeah, no. So, so it's absolutely true that a lot of neuroscience is still doing decompose and localize. They're taking psychological terms. They're operationalizing them in terms of neural operations. That comes with a bunch of computational baggage that, that may or may not be recognized in any particular case. But I'm taking Russ and Kevin and Johan at their word that neuroscientists themselves, when they actually think about these things, don't give a crap about that, right? What they're doing is investigating neural mechanisms. And so my suggestion is that's fine. So then just stop talking this other way, right? And that would be better for everybody. The, the only problem with that, Michael, if I can jump back in, and I'm a little conscious I've been talking too much, but um, the only problem with that is that it leads to a really, really reductive mechanistic view in neuroscience where mental content just doesn't come into it right you know it's it, it it's just neural operations these circuits fire those circuits fire and so on the meaning of of what the circuits uh well the, the meaning of the neural activity doesn't really come into the equation and that I, I think that's where actually a lot of neuroscience goes and you see very mechanistic kind of views where it's it, it's almost like we're eliminating intentions and desires and beliefs and you know the, the mental content and it's all just a machine yeah. whereas on the other side you've got the the cognitive science side where you know you're operating over these high level concepts um, and i guess what i'd like to see is put how to put the two of those together and it feels like they're talking different languages yeah yeah no i completely agree but i think in the current state of the art pretending you're addressing mental content is just obfuscation. So I think given the current state of the art, let's just own the fact that we're doing mechanistic explanation and we haven't reached psychology yet. 
well, as long as we're not as long as we're not in the process eliminating. Oh yeah, yeah, no, and, and, but you don't have to say that. You can say, look, I don't know what to say about consciousness. I don't know what to say about mental content, but I can tell you something about how this image gets processed, right, and how it leads to uh, differential behavior with respect to categorical, you know, different categories of objects. I can tell you well, interesting things about that. I mean, there's an interesting point there where the two things converge, I think, around, for me, the concept of meaning, right? What does a particular pattern mean? And it's easy to say a, a pattern, you know, means something if when the pattern is different, the next neural activity is different, right? That's just a, that's just a really mechanistic thing. Any pattern here is, has a consequence on the, the, the interpreting area that it innervates and changes the pattern here, right? That's not that just because something here reflects something in the world and has that impact doesn't mean it's representing something. I think it could be representing something if obviously you change, you change the pattern here, you change the pattern there, that's fine. That's still mechanistic. It can be representing something and mean something if you change the pattern here and it doesn't change the pattern here, right? There's multiple realizability, multiple kinds of, of patterns here all mean the same thing and they're interpreted through the pattern of synaptic weights, whatever the configuration of, of criteria is physically there, such that if the pattern is broadly within this range, right, this low dimensional manifold, then it means A. And if it's broadly in this other area, it means B. Um, to me, that multiple realizability is key to something qualifying as a representation in the sense that it works as a representation. And, and that feels like it can link the two levels together somewhat. Does that make sense? Don't we already have that with all of object recognition and all pattern recognition? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, um, and that's, that exists even in simple organisms. In fact, this is a re related to a point Bryce was making about, there was a um, recent paper about 13 evolutionary advances in, in, in our lineage. Uh, up, up, uh, and one of them was that uh, a particular chemical cue, even in a, I forget, it was a multicellular organism, the meaning of the cue could change depending on the satiety of the animal. So the same chemical cue shifted from being um, appetitive to aversive, depending on a condition. So even there, in this relatively simple organism, uh, the coupling is conditional. Um, so, so you need something in, invariant to the action, simply because the action may change depending on additional information. So you, if you like, you can call this an operation uh, of a certain conjunctive representation, which is satiety uh, uh, as one bit of information and presence and absence as another bit of information. And do you want to call that computation or not? Is, is like, from, from a modeler's perspective, you can call it what you like, <laughs> but it, 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 it does involve these two bits, right? Yeah, um, and you're right. I mean, even bacteria do integrate um, sensory stimuli to drive action. So that's they do some basal, what you would call cognition. They do it in a mechanistic way that doesn't necessarily involve representation. And I guess I mean, you you can think. I like to think of the the difference between a, a thermostat and a thermometer. So a, a thermostat is reflecting what's out in the world in, in how much the, you know, the, the neural, the, the, the metal thing is bending uh, and at a, at a certain temperature, it closes a, an electrical contact and something happens, right? Um, so the, there's, it, it's, it has a physical correlate. It. it has mutual information with something in the world, but it's not representing it to anything else. It's just acting on it. Whereas a thermometer is a representation, gives a representation. It's only useful to something that can look at it. Um, but it's very useful in the sense that you don't immediately have to act on it. You could, for example, you know, say your thermostat turns the AC on at a certain temperature. Well, with your thermometer, you could look at it and then you could decide, depending on the temperature and the humidity, whether you want to turn the AC on. So you, you can get flexibly integrate more information that way. To me, that's what representations get an organism in an evolutionary sense. That's the benefit cognitively and behaviorally it gives them that much more flexibility and sophistication and cognitive depth and range that you can't get just by coupling loads of things together. And you can show, you know, you can couple together maybe seven or eight different things kind of mechanistically before the, the system jams up and you just can't operate with it. And any more than that, it's just, you, you need to separate them out into, into layers. And I think that's what work 
representations, internal representations can do for an organism. Anyway, I'll stop talking. I'm putting Jabber in the way. Are there other people who haven't uh, discussed so far? I want to bring some points and questions, suggestions, confusions. We're all equally confused, so there's no really any differential there. So, <laughs> yes, go ahead, Roberto. There, there, there was one kind of axis that that I thought was helpful, at least for me, for navigating the the discussion. You no, know, so the, the the there would be on on one end, I would say, of the discussion, people that probably like me that that would think that the uh, an organism is mainly a, a thing on itself, and then there may be some processes within the organism that happen by almost by chance to to correlate to some extent with something that the neuroscientist would be observing. In the same way that, for example, the population of Chile would be correlated with the temperature of the planet. You no, know, it's it's not that there's any causal relationship between both, just correlation. So representation as correlation. In many, many cases, what I see neuroscientists doing is that type of thing. So you have, a, you have a brain that's firing action potentials and stuff. Then you happen to present whatever you want, like a pictures of Marilyn Monroe, whatever. And then sometimes there's some of this stuff that happens to correlate. It's never a one correlation. No, it's like a little correlation, but it, like it, it, it's enough that it's statistically significant. And then you call that a representation. Okay, then th there's a, a middle ground that I find like a, a bit tricky because in, in the idea where you have like an organism that's mainly working on its own, the, the, it's most of the time acting. So the, the, it, its motion would be the, the first thing that happens. Action is the first thing. And then the, the influence of the outside would be like, like some sort of a, a, a thing that happens. Then in the in the middle ground there, there was this this idea of the people that were suggesting that representation was some sort of active process of extracting a, a, a reduced dimensionally reduced version of of the the environment. Okay, and then in that case, uh, as you were discussing earlier, uh, the link with action is more tricky you now because once you have this dimensionally reduced version of the outside, like what do you do with it, and then on, on the other end. Uh, I think there was this, this idea of representation as a symbol that you use for computation. Okay, then in, in that case, it's really, it's really this idea of ca causality that, that Russ was mentioning at some point. So a representation, it's not just the, 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 the lower dimensional embedding, it has to be causal. There has to be, it has to be able to produce something. So it has to be something that you operate on. And, and I think that from the, the, those to me would be the, the, the and, and then, in this case, also the operation, the computation would lead to some action. So I see the apple, I take the apple and I, and I, and I eat it or I give it to someone else. Whatever. So there would be the, the, this axis would be from representation as me, mere covariation, representation as extraction of a, a dimensionally reduced version of the input data, and then representation as a symbol used for computation, which seems to me to be valid, uh, as uh, Michael was mentioning earlier, probably mostly in the in the field of language, or or, or you know th that would be probably the place where it's the most clear that some concept like that would be useful. But probably for sensory systems where you have, for example, not only one representation of the visual field, but many many going from V1 to MT, whatever. Like there's so many different representations of the visual space. I don't think that anyone would think that they are each of them related to some specific mental state, whatever. It's, 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 that, that would be more tricky. So this has access, at least for me, I, I think it was, it was useful. Could I, um, Luis, do you mind if I just share my screen again? Because there's something that yeah, just no, followed. No, 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 of course. Yeah, go so ahead. It follows from what uh, Roberto just said. Let me see if I can find the, uh, where is it? So I think it's this. Um, can you see this that says perceptual representations? Is that what you're looking at? Is it moving? No, maybe it's something else. 
we're looking at representation people and somehow I'm on this list. I'm not sure. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Sorry. I'm keeping track of you all. So. <laughs> <laughs> let me, uh, let me, that's the wrong one. You weren't supposed to see that. All right. You're on the naughty, you're on the naughty list now. This one. Um, so first of all, yeah, I think here, this, this kind of uh, gets to the nub of it for me, and it relates to what you were talking about there, Roberto, I think. Um, for something to qualify as a representation, it should function as a representation. So it should be about something, but it should also be for something. I think this is really mm -hmm. um, relates to uh, Milliken's sort of uh, in, um, framing as well. It, it has to be meaningful for the organism, which I would say is, is referential and consequential. Um, and this multiple realizability comes in there. It, could, it, it, it must be true that if it were different, it could mean something different, but it also should be true that it can be different and mean the same thing, um, paradoxically, I think. And then the downstream areas have to interpret it through these criteria set in the, in the synaptic weights, and maybe they can perform an operation on it. They, you know, the sum, the something happens when a signal goes from V1 to V2, it gets transformed in the process. You know, we like to think of these, we draw these uh, hierarchical areas, you know, models of, of the cortex. You've got V1 and we think what happens in V1 and what happens in V2. Most of the action happens as you go from V1 to V2 or V2 to V4, but then things happen within each of those areas as well. You know, some computation does happen, I think, neurally, neurally speaking. Um, the, the useful thing, I guess, in the, the thing that really makes it qualify as a representation is that it can be, broadcast to multiple areas at once they can use it or not right they can ignore it if they want to and so it's that decoupling from from action that i feel makes something more uh, of a representation and less of a just a concrete signal um and there was just one other thing here which i was thinking about with respect to perceptual reg representations that you know you can get a direct signal in your photoreceptors you get a process signal even already in your retinal ganglion cells that is making an inference. It's an inference that there's a that there's an edge or a contrast or something. You know, the contrast lateral inhibition and so on um, sets up um, a different kind of a signal in the retinal ganglion cells as you go to thalamus and cortex. Each of those areas is making an inference. That's the transformation operation that they're doing. So, so for me, the the representation might not be that there is a line out there. It's a representation that of the belief that there's a line out there, right? V2 believes there's a line out there and it tells V4 that there is. Um, and they can be wrong, right? We know from optical illusions and so on that those beliefs can be wrong where, um, whereas, you know, maybe direct signals hitting your photoreceptors, they're not wrong, right? They just are what they are. So anyway, I, I um, just wanted to throw that out there to the idea of representations as beliefs as opposed to direct reflections of, of yes. what's in the world. Let me, let me just point something out here. This is not a criticism. It's just pointing out that as you're talking, you're treating the brain as a message passing system. Well, right? and that's, a, that's yeah. a very particular frame, maybe valid, maybe not, but, but you know, uh, this has this signal and it means this thing and it passages that, passes that message to, you know, from V1 to V2. And the dynamic systems hypothesis suggests that message passing is the wrong frame to, to use when thinking of, of the brain. So that, again, this is, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying that was a very particular frame that you adopted yeah, yeah. as we were describing this. And just to follow up on that, there's a, a view that I think doesn't get discussed very often, which I really like which is an analogy to various kinds of analog signal manipulation, which are gonna sit sort of midway between a straight dynamic story and the kind of information processing story that you're telling. So the analogy, think about what happens when you pluck a guitar string um, and you're running a guitar through a network of information processing effects those are gonna be analog signal manipulators that are doing things like amplifying the structure of the signal. They're um, changing the way that the waveform is structured. They're manipulating it by clipping off some parts of the attack, some parts of the delay. 
And those kinds of things can go on without ever representing anything as meaningful, but can nonetheless allow for the kind of information processing that allows things to be passed sequentially through multiple stages of a process. And importantly, you can have multiple things operating in parallel that can then feed back together to yield a pulled result, which will yield a particular kind of output that is a, a function of the coordinated activity of all the interacting effects. And that looks to me something more like what we're talking about when we're talking about what goes on in the brain. And it's not obvious to me that you need to ever in that story talk about anything that's meaningful for any of the relevant systems. Um, all they have to do is take the waveform that they're given, transform it in the way that they're, do, they're supposed to do and yield the kinds of outputs that they're supposed to yield. Well, that's true, Bryce, but a guitar doesn't have to survive. Well, oh, certainly. Um, and I, I mean, this is exactly where we need to figure out how to integrate a story about computation if we're going to have one, be it analog computation or be it more digital computation, into a story about how organisms pursue vitality. And you're not going to get that story just by appealing to the structure of the connectome. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I agree. And I think. Um... I mean, this comes back to where we started, I think, tonight with this sort of um, uh, tension between the dynamical systems approach and a computational representational approach, I guess. I, I don't see any reason why uh, you can't compute with dynamical systems or you can't represent with dynamical systems. It, that just seems to be, or, or you, know, you can't do it just as well or even better with analog than with, than with digital. Um, I'll take all of that. I mean, I don't see any reason to reject any of that. Uh, I think probably all of those mechanisms are at play and um, any of them can carry information and any of that information can amount to a representation if it has the properties of a representation and it's used as such. That's the way I would view it. That might be a good opportunity to ask what information is because a lot of people want to say that when I say information, I mean something other than Shannon information. But the more I think about it, the more information starts to sound like representation when you take it out of that Shannon context. Well, I agree. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, what we want here, Shannon information is just not relevant here except for signal transmission and trying to figure out how the brain efficiently passes messages and energy efficiency and so on, which is, I mean, th that's super, strong constraints on the way the brain is put together, but it has nothing to do with the content, right? Because Shannon information is nothing about content. It's, it, it, that's why a random sequence has the highest Shannon information over a sentence. Um, so it doesn't fit with a, an intuitive idea of information as being meaningful and having any content. Um, but even Shannon recognized that and used mutual information, information about something, that's what the organism needs, information about something. Um, and that's the question whether, you know, that's the basic sort of definition that, again, Roberto was saying that neuroscientists use. There's a correlation between a pattern in the brain and something out in the world. And um, maybe it's a spurious correlation, or maybe it's one that the organism actually uses because it means to the organism that there's something X is out in the world there doing that. Yeah, that, that's going to depend a lot on which neuroscientists you're talking about. The Friston crowd, for instance, really thinks they're dealing with Shannon information. They're, they're wrong. Do you, but do they you think really so? think they deal with Shannon information. Yeah, Shannon information to me is just um, not relevant here, really. I I'm totally agree with you. But I'm just pointing out in, the, in, in the broader field, yeah. there, are, there are many very prominent people who think they what they're describing is the, the transmission and the manipulation of Shannon information. Hmm. Roberto. Yeah, just wanted to, to point that, I think that we, we could of course blur the, the difference between a dynamical system and, and, and a computational system and blur the difference between information and just a signal and et cetera. But I, I like this, this paper by Walter Freeman that, that someone, uh, tweeted about uh, that, that was kind of warning to some extent about the danger of 
using the concept of representation. So uh, Johan several times said, you call it representation or, or call it whatever you want, but you know what, I'm meaning this. But I think that there's a, there's, there, there is a danger in using uh, representation when it's not the appropriate thing to, to think about. And what uh, Walter Freeman was suggesting is that the idea of representation puts somehow an emphasis on the outside. So you are trying to see how the outside maps in the, in the, in the brain. And, and he was arguing in, the, in, the, in this paper that that prevents, prevented them for, for a long time when they were trying to see how different odors would map into the olfactory cortex from just looking at what the, actually the olfactory cortex uh, was doing on, on, on itself. So by focusing on representation, there's a bunch of things that may seem secondary that you will not pay attention to and not using the concept, that concept on the contrary would allow you to, to take into account some other type of uh, processes. Yeah, Bryce, go ahead. Oh, I was just waving goodbye to Ross. Um, oh. I, can, I can say something though, which I, I think is probably pretty relevant here. I mean, a lot of the variables that need to be tracked in order to sustain vitality are gonna be ones that are continuously varying. And they're gonna be ones that are states of the system as a whole, not relations to things that are external and not things that are just the brain doing the relevant tracking. So if you think about all of the stuff that is involved in motivating, for example, the search for salt, um, that's something that's going on across multiple temporal scales, across multiple kinds of temporal uh, tracking mechanisms some of which might be monitored and adjusted by the brain, but a lot of them are distributed throughout the structure of the body. And getting that into a nice tight computational story probably isn't gonna happen. Yeah, I think um, just to follow up on, on the, um, what Roberto was saying about Walter Freeman's work, which I think is great, um, it, it seems to be coming around again. You get uh, people like Bjorn Brems and, and Yuri Bujaki and um, Paul Chizik, um, you know, thinking much more in, in, in terms of the, the, the organism having ongoing internal activity and accommodating to signals that are coming into it, as opposed to being a passive stimulus response input output kind of a thing, you know, much more of this interactive loop with the, um, with the environment where the organism is driving it and, um, and it's reacting to uh, or accommodating to that incoming um, information, but in a very active way. And, you know, I mean, we've seen with recent work on, you know, representations shifting over time. And so on, it's very reminiscent of um, Freeman's early work on the olfactory stuff. The one thing I will say is that, um, you know, the olfactory system may have a fair, uh, it has a very different job to do than the visual system. And uh, it has maybe less opportunities for internal processing or less of a need for internal processing in order for the organism to get the information that's useful to it, right? So the olfactory system, what's useful is, do I smell a chemical or not? Where is it? Uh, and how much of, there, of it is there? You don't have to do a ton of processing internally to do that. Whereas the visual system, if you want to segregate um, the visual world into objects, and you want to color code them and segment them and you want to track them in time and uh, motion and so on, that does require le levels of, of internal processing. So it may be that Freeman's uh, approach there because it was grounded in the olfactory system doesn't have as much of a need for internal representations as, um, as you might have in the visual system. I've got to run, thank you. Uh, thanks, That's Luis, possible. for organizing. All right, sure. And, uh, I'm sure the conversation will continue in various uh, forums. <laughs> Ciao. Thanks, Michael. <laughs>non-obligatoriness of a specific action is sort of related to representation. So I'm curious if anyone would not like that. Because I, I actually, so some of you read this essay I wrote about representing, representing means exactly what you mean it is. And I very purposely wrote that representations mediate 
the potential for action. And the reason I kept saying potential was precisely this, that, that if you just have some sort of action loop, then you can think of it more like a physicist does. It is just transmitting energy of some sort that causes the hand to move. And, um, but most of the models that when people say that such and such is a presentation of a face of an action or whatever, they, they don't typically mean something that is automatically goes from stimulus to, to action. So does anyone have a different a reason not to accept that as a, as a, at least one criterion of representation? I mean, it seemed to me a, a, a really good phrase it in, in the sense that, yeah. And so I, I, I tend to agree that that seems, that seem that sentence seemed to stick to me like, oh, that carries information. Yeah, that was, yeah. yeah. Robin had a question uh, uh, a second ago. Um, do you wanna um, to still want to ask it? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, it may be a naive question, but throughout this whole conversation, as, um, as others have pointed out, like Roberto, there seems to be many different ways of using the word representation. And considering the importance of precision of language, it seems like it's inevitable that the word representation is ambiguous, right? Like I play this fun game in the cognitive neuroscience literature where I just replace the word representation with correlation and you lose nothing. So why are we holding on to this particular word. I mean, all of these concepts we've been talking about are really interesting and really important, but like, I feel like a lot of the conversation gets lost because of the different. Well, let me just point one thing out and another pe other people can clarify it much more than, I'm just gonna allude to what Michael, I think answered that quite nicely in the sense that, in according at least to his view, that the traditional sort of philosophy or language uh, angle had basically defined those terms and, and, and it basically became entrenched in a way of, of referring to things and it was borrowed by then cognitive science and cognitive science to neuroscience. And then all of, all of a sudden it morphed into all this dozen different ways of, of talking about things even as simply as saying something that is just a correlation. Okay, this signal correlates with, um, with oriented edges, oblique edges, and so it represents it. And so I think you're absolutely right, but I, I, he's not here to clarify, but I think his, his notion was, was, was a good one that, um, that it really is this baggage that has to do with this really powerful way of thinking about things that have to do with language, with, with variables and, in a way that is, is, is quite detached from many levels, detached from the way that eventually gets used in, in, in many neuroscience studies. And by what I was saying, the typical neuroscientist was down the hall from me, who is doing a rat physiology. They say, they, they, they don't even know of these debates that we're talking about, this way of thinking or the, these ways of thinking. It's funny, Robin, you remind me of, um debates around the use of the term epigenetics in the genetics community, which really drives me bananas uh, because it means loads of different things to different people. And the, the meaning just gets, um, you know, elided all the time. And I'm always telling people, if you, if you mean gene regulation, say gene regulation. And if you mean transgenerational effects, say that. And if you mean development or non-genetic, just say precisely what you mean and just avoid that word altogether. But I, I, it was funny. Um, I'm going to risk sharing my screen again for just one moment because I was reading a paper recently that was um, about, uh, let's see, where is it? So I, I had a whole discussion about someone and then at the end I realized that the one day were saying uh, epigenetics, they were talking about methylation. No, and yeah, I was yeah. thinking like anything that's not genetics that's involved into an organism, like it yeah. was completely different. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is a paper by um, Ernst von Glasersfeld from 1987, which is, I was just reading recently, but I, I'm just bringing it up here because it's one of the first things he does is actually try to distinguish various meanings of the word representation in English because they have different translations in German. So there's four different German words that all translate as representation in English that mean different things. So one is a, an iconic sketch that depicts something 
another is thinking of something in your own mind. Uh, this one is representing is, is acting for, which you know is relevant in the brain as well, or standing for, signifying uh, as a sign is, and all of them have different words. So maybe we just need to go back to incorporating more German into our scientific discourse. They always have just the right word for, I exactly catch it, that's right, you know. Um, they always have just the right word for what we, for what we need. But then I, I wanna get back to, to Robin's question then, which is, uh, and, and I sort of was alluding a little bit to that in a sense in the very beginning was, why in the world do we have to keep on using it? Because during this whole conversation, this hour and a half, everyone still seems completely enamored of it. And, and, and there was never a say like, maybe, I, I, I'm, all, I'm with Robin, I just don't understand it. I, I don't understand, I don't understand what's, what's what we gain. And like you said, in the context of, of epigenetics and what, say what you mean. And yeah. what do I mean? Well, let me, uh, and that's I mean, what I meant. Like when I'm uh, speaking that V1 represents an edge, I mean this. Ah, okay, fine. So you either use represents and then you say represents and then you put in a bra in parentheses or whatever convention you want to say that this is what I mean. It's not, confu it's not confusing. You can word use whatever word. You can put it in German if you want, what have you. But, but I, I completely agree that I think that if we don't do that, I, I just don't know what people are even talking about. Like, so to what me, is the conversation about yeah, like, yeah. and then someone alludes to, because we all have limited knowledge about fields and some, something highly technical about language or about philosophy or about whatever, or something, even something that I, I'm, I'm speaking as a neuroscientist and not understanding that a philosopher is not in tune with this use of, of I don't know, just, it just fires, this neuron just fires. So I call it represent. So, so, I, so I think that that I mean, is, that's what is really needed so that we can see yeah. when is it needed. And then for those reasons, we can call it representation or can even come up with a new word and call it like, this is really the mystery that we need to solve because we yeah. want to advance how we understand complex behaviors and how complex behaviors map to complex and not so complex nervous systems and whatnot. Well, I, I think two things. First of all, I think we want to understand how the activity of the brain relates to the activity of the mind, right? And representation may be a bridge. I think people have thought of it as a bridge between those two things, but clearly we don't know you know, we don't have a good understanding even of the definitions of neural versus mental representations, never mind the relationship between them. But I think that's, I think that's why there's an appeal to the idea of representations. But personally, I'm using it currently in thinking about this transition from pragmatic direct couplings of sensory signals to, to actions or fairly direct um, versus in evolution when you got to internal decoupled ones that, that don't have an obligatory uh, response to action. They, they inform the potential for action. And the argument, I guess the reason I'm trying to use representation and the, the work that it's doing for me is to make an argument that the nervous system is not just a mechanism, it's running on meaning. That for me is the important point. And representation is a, is a concept that I find really useful to try and make that point. I think uh, the computer. Robin, were you going to say something? Go ahead. I was going to respond uh, to Kevin. Um, that is a use that representation has, right? To link this kind of perception action um, basic uh, coupling to more abstract, often seen as human functions that the brain can do. And I actually really like the way um, James Gibson. I'm betraying myself as a Gibsonian here, thinks about mental imagery. And he, he describes it as the visual system visualizes. After enough time of experiencing the world in a certain way, you're able to decouple from the, as he calls it, stimulus flux and do basically the same thing, just detached from the immediate environment or, or time or what, what have you. And so, and you might not agree with this, but he discusses it in a way that doesn't need to appeal to this other sort of 
thing, right? It's the same thing just done, like abstracted away from the immediate environment. Um, yeah. yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's the <laughs> the crux of our of our puzzles, right? I mean, do we really need it? And 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 I'm gonna push back a tiny bit on on Kevin's uh, point. Uh, about the decoupling, it's actually interesting because um, uh, this I have I've just finished this this draft. I'll, I'll I'll send it to you, Kevin. But I just finished this draft of uh, a very basic uh, introduction to the brain. But one 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 chapter that I have it, I gave I sent to Bryce, and I, he I don't know if he remembers any of the diagrams, but it's a chapter that talks exactly about this uncoupling, and and I, to me this uncoupling is. Is so essential in biology, in, in living organisms. And I, I, I was restricted to just the vertebrates, all the vertebrates. And I, I have not, as, not too much knowledge about invertebrates, but I would suspect that I can easily carry that argument to invertebrates as well. So I think this uncoupling is, is, so, is so critical in functioning and in surviving that as a criterion, although I'm very sympathetic to the, all the ideas that you were mentioning, I think that building in terms of, of, of having a boundary between things that were used to be not so coupled or not, to a, this uncoupling happens so early on in evolution and it's so complex and so, 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 so elaborate even in, in all amphibians and fishes that I think unless we, want to go back to really uh, very simple uh, nervous nets and other kinds of things that I don't know as much about but so that, that is where I'm starting Louise is yeah the, yeah so exactly so hydras and, and jellyfish right so but I think that exactly so I think that there's a if you treat it and I'm sure you're going to do this in a sophisticated way so but if you treat it as something that is is, is, a, is a gradation and and that obviously but what I, I guess the only point that I make is that by the time that you get a vertebrates, it's so complex the uncoupling that, that even the snapping of the, the 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 frog is a really poor example, I think, because in the vertebrates are just too complex for even to to for us to because there is already a paleo a pallium there that is integrated with striatum and, and with the hindbrain and the in the midbrain and the hypothalamus. It's just it's it's like the the picture that Bryce always brings back, which is these, this barrage of signals kind of like circulating and, and, and informing and, and, and transforming and influencing each other. Sure, so I that's think that, our, that's the, yeah, the that, that, was, that was all. Right? That's the flexibility that you get by, by building in those extra, those extra layers, but you can trace an evolutionary arc from the simplest organisms with the simplest nervous systems and see what does, what does even having a nervous system in the beginning get I, you? I completely agree. I'm what not saying you when, you, when you add some layers and so on. And, and at some point, but in a gradual way, yeah. you get these internal representations. But even, I mean, it doesn't have to be all or none, right? I mean, even yeah. within us, yeah, yeah. we use internal representation for yeah. something, but other, other ones, we, we still have loads of, you know, our yeah. like um, yeah. eye, automatic eye shifts and so on. You know, that, that's all running just very mechanistically doesn't yeah. pragmatically doesn't we don't have to think about the thing and then decide to move our eyes right so we can we can still have lots of um mm -hmm. almost automated behavior we're still running all of that hardware we just have some more sophisticated control systems on top of it and actually i guess um rather than the, the computational view i i would very much take the control system view and ask what good is a representation in a control system? I right. think that has yeah. some interesting yeah, I think that's, that's uh, a, angles to uh -huh. Yeah, I think in a lot of uh, uh, computational models that close the perception action loop, like when I say that I've implemented a salience map in the amygdala in one of my models, all I mean is like, like I don't think any word other than map and representation conveys all the meanings because I'm not an experimentalist. I'm not talking about correlation. I am talking about something causal so that if you remove that particular part of the model, something breaks and that 
so so it's not I can't replace the it with the word correlation because it isn't an experimental concept. It's something that if you like you could like in principle just present a bunch of differential equations and say call all these things whatever you feel like <laughs> based on the, when you what, what you look at when you look at the graph, right? But uh, when I try, in fact, as a result of all these Twitter conversations, like I didn't really know that representation is controversial, but I started to remove the word from conversation now talking to people, and I found it actually quite difficult, particularly when talking about models. Like it was okay for talking about experiments, but for models, I found it like I literally had to stop and think, now what do I say? Uh, <laughs> I can say presentation once in a while, and I can once in a while say mediation, but sometimes it sounds really weird uh, <laughs> to say those things. Like I've tried. It, and it's what I will do from now on, but it's quite odd. But they're instantiating certain things in your model, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and if you if like obviously the computational neuroscientists, we haven't proved ourselves as experimentalists mostly ignore us, but but if you're going to get a theoretical story, I would assume the computational neuroscientists will have something to do with it, right? Yeah, and I mean that, that idea, like, you know, from the, the control theory point of view, of course, you'll get all kinds of aspects of the regularities of the world instantiated in the structure of the thing that's modeling the world, right? In order to be a, to, to respond well, it has to, it has to model um, the world. And, and um, some of those are going to be, you know, most of those are going to be just very implicit structural uh, mappings of one kind or another whether they qualify as representations or whether calling them a representation is useful or not. Again, that's an open question, you know, and I think the test is when I use that word, does it do some work here? Does it attach to a concept that I'm talking about that I want to distinguish from a mere correlation or a mere uh, physical instantiation that is part of a model of the regularities of the world or something else? Is it used as a representation? Guess it comes back to you. If, if I can say so, this this link between the the representation as what we can measure in brain activity and then the mental representation is is actually super interesting. So, in thinking, for example, about the the theory of autopoiesis, you know, the the theory proposed for to explain how a non living matter can turn into life, and then there's all this idea of self reference, etc. And then at some point. You, you move away from just dead matter, let's say, to, to, to life. And then somehow it, it, Maturana and Varela let, let that theory uh, spill into some theory of cognition. But I, I think that the, the difference is much more clear when, when people talk about an, an activism, which is actually the, the way in which life would somehow, by, by a process that may be kind of similar to that of autopoiesis, turn just a living organism with all its constraints and self-referentiality, et cetera, into a, an organism that has a mind. So that could be probably an, another layer, no? So you have non-living matter, biology, and then a, a mind. So probably one, one could write a, a, a paper similar to what is life, that would be what is mind. So wh what does it take for a living organism to be able to produce a mind? So that there will be probably some relationship between the representation in the living organism of the, the, its activity, and then something that happen, that's happening in broad, like a, a different dimension you know, in, 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 in the mind, in those living organisms that happen to be able to cross that threshold that makes that they have a mind. Right, but Roberto, we don't need to, to write that book because it's been written, right? So <laughs> mind there's in few, life. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. Uh, mind, in, <laughs> mind in life by, by Evan, right? I mean, it's exactly it's exactly his view of how mind essentially in life. So it's taking Maturana and Varela and that that basic notion and taking it in creating a mind. The, the, the level that you're saying, the level of the mind, right? So I mean, I'm like anything with its strengths and weaknesses. So I'm not saying that, you know, it's, 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 it's a de definitive outcome, but I think that a lot of it within that perspective ha has been developed and, and it should be something that would be interesting to, to revisit. I mean, we should definitely get Evan to, to participate, mm. to actually give his view of, of how, how mind is this life phenomenon, right? So it's how, how it, it's bootstrapped in some sense, 
from this very basic notion of autopoiesis of, of life. And, 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 and yeah, I think that would be very, be very interesting to see and how that informs this debate that we're having in terms of representation and computation and external world and the more, 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 more the perspective also that we need is, is I, in my view is, and some, something that I happen to know very little is more this, uh, a, a Gibsonian type of view in which we dismiss and we fall into, into these internalist ways of thinking that have several frameworks, including the inactive framework and, and, and Gibsonian and other frameworks have provided alternatives to. So I think that that would be very useful because otherwise we, we keep reiterating a, a certain kind of discussion that is, I, I think is somewhat fruitful, but it's within a, a, a tradition of thinking when there are two or three others quite important that I think that we need to consider to see the extent to which they can force us and push us back to, to consider other ways of viewing this. And, and so do we really need these kinds of concepts when we're talking about these things, brains and minds, and the relationship between brains and minds? Yeah, and probably to, to, to what extent trying to find mind representations related to biological representations would be like trying to find a relationship between the biological representations and the properties of the molecules that make up the organism. I mean, probably that's quite quite extreme, but but it could be there could be something to. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, I think that's that that example really um, makes it very palpable, right? So is, is that something like is that what we're trying to do, and we're just not seeing it that way? Yeah. Again, I mean, I think um, Paul uh, Chizik, uh, you know, has stuff along the same lines very much as well, but does actually bring in the, the Gibsonian. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, you can think of um, an individual cell, the early life forms as control systems that keep themselves operating within certain parameters. And in order to do that, the, the relations that they have between their components embody, first of all, the constraints of the system, right? They generate the constraints of the system that keep it the way that it is. Um, but they also in some way reflect the regularities of the environment um, that, that they have to, in a sense, expect to be a certain way that they're adapted to, right? They're fitted to the environment and the structural relationships within that network, mm -hmm. in a sense, reflect that. They instantiate aspects of the regularities of the environment, um, even to the point of some of those aspects being represented, instantiated in the genome, right? Where the genome is the template that, that the, the cell can refer to every once in a while when it needs to say, oh, shit, how, how much of this protein am I supposed to make here? Oh yeah, that's right. Um, or I got, I got shifted out of my, my regime. I, you know, what's, where should I be? And they check the, check the genome um, or it replicates and you have a new cell and the new cell has to um, kick, kickstart all those processes again and, and it refers to the genome. So I think you, know, you, can, you can go down and down and down when you're thinking about these these representations all the way to the genetic level, which I, I find really um, fascinating, actually. Do we have you on record as saying that DNA is a representation? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you do. Well, I mean, he, he called it a template. So it, it, he did. <laughs> is, that, is that okay? Am I... <laughs> I mean, I, think, I, I agree completely, which is why it's, I've always been baffled because I think I think template map, I think these, it's very hard to describe behavior without at least a full range of behavior. So, yeah, yeah. but, and then just to move this ahead, because I think this is a place people are not going to move that much. But what about imagination? When I think about a dragon, am I representing something? It doesn't exist and there's nothing to correlate with. What do you mean it doesn't exist? Yeah, it well, doesn't the dragon exist. itself doesn't exist. Like if I imagine something that doesn't exist, I'm, let's say I'm a fantasy writer and I'm cooking up uh, a fictional beast, you know, dragons I've seen before, but let's say it's a new one. <laughs> no, I'm well, just joking. Yeah. I, I, um, I uh, have, I'm representing, let's, uh, in, my, in my pragmatic sense, the individual features are being represented, claws, skin, fur, whatever. But the overall thing, isn't a representation of something in the world that you can correlate as a whole. So, but what other word would you like to use <laughs> for it? For the, I, for, I think representation is perfect. I don't think it has to correlate with something real. That's a good word to use for that. <laughs> yeah. I think it fits for that better than anything else, yeah.
I, I mean, I guess this is one of the points where I think the excluding of um, say Gibsonian and, and activist perspectives really shows how deeply entrenched particular kinds of attitudes are. So from that perspective, the question is gonna be, if we start with dynamic coupling and start to make sense of patterns of uncoupled activity, how far can we go mm -hmm. making sense of things from that perspective before we run into a problem that we're unable to solve without yeah. appealing to representations? And that gives you a very different kind of theoretical orientation and it's going to highlight yeah. very different kinds of activity. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. Yeah, because we're starting from this other position here, right? Completely and not from the other side and seeing when do you actually force to use something like that? And it would be really fascinating to see if we could, if that as an exercise, how when is it that we get so stuck that we actually have to have Johan's representation so that he's happy? Right. Simpler example. Okay. Let's take Steve Grossberg example. So when a predator chasing for something in a forest and it goes behind a tree or around a curve. There's nothing to do. It's a clearly useful and evolutionarily uh, you know, advantageous to be able to do this. While the animal is behind the tree, it's not like you forget about it. So what do you call the structure that mediates you know, the, the fact that it's behind the tree? You're perceiving it behind the tree. That's what Gibson would say. Because you have an experience like even an infant, right? Yeah. Understands, is constantly, you know, has the experience of things going out of sight and coming back into sight. I think it, the, exactly. the problem start, pardon? No, no, exactly. I think you're abs absolutely, yeah. You don't, don't stop perceiving it when it goes behind the tree. Yeah, I think Because perception is extended in time. It's I not think, snapshot. Yeah, Object I think you know, it takes a while to actually form. So, so it's like, what has been learned or what, what has the developmental uh, uh, program given? Yeah, but what why does it, it have to be, why does it form? have to be a representation that there is something physical behind that thing? So let me, let me, yeah, continue the discussion. I'll, I'll show up a picture uh, in me, a second here. Well, let me chime in and you can come back, Louise. Uh, I would say if you think of perception as inference and that you're, you're perceiving something when you're seeing it is an inference that the object exists and is out there moving in the world, that that inference will persist when it goes behind the tree without the, what you could call the isolated percepts that have been informing it necessarily persisting. So I would say the, yeah, if it's perception as inference, then that's persisting. But the, the, the low level sort of neural correlates that were informing the percept no longer persist. But the inference, I, I guess, what the point, right? The whole point of seeing is to infer objects exist in the world and where they are and what they're doing. That can, that can persist for sure. I, I guess one of the things that I would say is it's not clear to me that the animal needs to represent the presence of the predator. It needs to continue to be sensitive to the threat. And a lot of the kinds of uh, processes that are gonna mediate threat sensitivity are gonna be things that have longer temporal uh, scales than what's currently in the visual field. So it's gonna be things like the um, levels of saturation for different neurotransmitters. It's gonna be things like the ways in which different regulatory structures are operating. It's gonna be the ways that the heart rate and the breathing are being regulated in response to potential predation. And all of those things are gonna persist even if the immediate visual stimuli falls out. And if you drop that then back into a Gibsonian story, the story is that the perception of a predator is something that unfolds over multiple timescales, and it depends on all of those cycles of activity. Well, that's fine, Bryce, but I would say that's the recognition of something as a predator, right? The recognition that it is a threat. But what about if you're the predator, right? And you're tracking something and your goal is not just to be afraid, it's to, to, to plot an intercept course, and it happens to go behind the tree and you have to expect it to come out the other side. Um, you at least have to have a persistence of the inference that the thing exists, I think, and, a, and some persistence of the trajectory that it was on and make a prediction of where it will come out on the other side of the tree if you're to be successful, I think. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very, I'm very um, sympathetic to the, to the ecological approach and the Gibsonian approach, but I do find it a little frustrating in, if it goes all the way of just sort of um, 
rejecting the idea that you can use representations and, and that there is some internal signaling as well of those affordances and, and so on. It's in, I don't know why there's such a tension between those two things. It feels like it gets it gets extreme in, in reaction to an extreme reaction when because I mean it, it all makes sense. sense. It all makes sense together to me. Right, but my suspicion is that we 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 invoke it so much the representation for like for instance I I guess I'm sharing the screen you can see this this lion here, this lioness uh, or this young lion here uh, with the zebras right. And and so you know when I share this picture uh, on on Twitter and say you know what's what's this this the lion here representing you know like uh, you know as a as, as a joke and so. I, to a lot of people, there doesn't have to be any explicit representation that even though the, these zebras are not visible to the lion here because of its, it, it, it's, it is a part of some dynamic behavior here that has been learned over many years of being taught and learning the behavior of the world and whatnot that doesn't require some explicit representation of that thing that is absent, right? So I think that we use it so much that I, I guess that the other camp, the Gibsonians and the others react very strongly and, and I think rightly reminding us that we don't have to invoke it all the time. But I think your point is equally important is like, don't we have to invoke it at some point, which is also Bryce's point. So like, let's make this whole thing break and then at at that point, we can be more convinced. But if we bring it and use it at, at the very earliest instances, I think we do a huge amount of disservice because it seems like, okay, we're just constructing this thing. The, the, it's a computer metaphor. All vision is to construct an internal representation of the world. And, and therefore, it's not a mystery. It's, you, you actually have a little representation of the, the thing behind the tree. So maybe, or maybe not. So, but if we don't have this debate, I think we have this tendency of assuming something that will generate this opposition. And so I think that's why the debate gets superheated. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, and I very much like Bryce's uh, sort of way of, uh, of road testing things to say, well, that, you know, let's see how far we can get without them. Um, and then, but, uh, you know, I would be open then to the, to the point that we do need them at some, st at some stage if only because we know we we have symbolic you know representations in, mm -hmm. in, in human language. So you know if you start with really simple stuff, move up there. At some point, you're gonna you're going to invoke them. I think. Right. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense to me. I'm having some pinging here that I'm gonna have to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and um, I think that you know this was uh, so a, a wonderful discussion. So I think that. I don't know if people want something completely different, but we could definitely bring some people with a Gibsonian viewpoint and we can uh, enact uh, frameworks and other kinds of things. So maybe if you have suggestions uh, beyond representations, but all these problems are interconnected, what, what's computation, what's, what, what, what the brain and mind are. So it's, it's all interconnected in some sense. So send some suggestions and and then we'll we'll try to schedule uh, a next se next next session, and we have to find ways to be more uh, more friendly towards so the people in other time zones. I really apologize that this is so late for some can people. I, can I make one suggestion? It's a an area yeah yeah of course yeah. We didn't really get to uh, today so much was this yeah. very current debate in like deep learning and AI and so on between people like you know Yashua Bengio and and Jan LeCun on one side and Jeff Hinton and um, like uh, very prominently Gary Marcus on the other side where, where um, you know, Gary would say all this deep learning stuff is great, but it's just brute force and, and, and ignorance and it's not how the brain works. The brain does, you know, it, it, it's, it's the algebraic mind um, and it's really doing symbol, symbolic mm -hmm. representations and, and, and computation. And you're going to need to put that in there mm -hmm. in order to get real artificial general intelligence. Um, so anyway, it's like I said, it's an area where the representation debate becomes like commercially important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it translates to money. Yeah, yeah it translates <laughs> to money exactly. And, and so anyway, it might be interesting to invite someone, someone like that. I'd certainly love to hear. Yeah, it would um, be wonderful. I mean, I, I, I don't have my contacts don't reach that far. 
but if uh, someone does have um, some some way of attracting some of them, yeah. and well, I might. Be, um, I mean, I mean if you guys wonderful. I, I I could ask Gary, for example. Uh, yeah, well, I mean that. I mean, you know, this is open to to all of us, and this is by no means something that I just want to run. And this is all mine. Is like, whatever people want to 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 suggest is is, is the direction that we sh I think we should go. Absolutely. So by all means, if you have some way of, con I mean, so far I've been finding, trying to coordinate this to the time that works and other kinds of things. But if in, in this n new one, you, you want to take a lead um, by all means, and uh, we should we, we'd be more than happy. It would be fantastic. Well, we could maybe, um, to, you know, people could, could put in suggestions, maybe, I don't know, have, send them to you, Louise, on, or put them on Twitter or whatever. And we could, um, we could bat some ideas around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but if you know Gary, that would be that would be a lot a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, yeah. I can, I can sound them out anyway. Yeah. Great. Okay, everyone. I think that was great. Thanks. Thanks. All. <laughs> Bye. Bye.